Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the October ERM Toolbox webinar on how to read an actuarial report. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. If you've dialed in by phone but haven't logged in by computer and you'd like to see the slides that will be shown, please point your web browser to readytalk.com. In the box where it says participant, join a meeting, enter the same access code that you use to join the call, 987-9821. We are leaving the phone lines open, so please stay aware of the level of background noise in your area. And if it starts to become noisy, please put your phone on mute. Uh, to self-mute your line, you can simply hit star 6. To unmute it, it's star 7. If you're called away from your phone, please do not put your phone on hold because that will cause your hold music to be transmitted to everybody else on the call. You can simply hang up, dial back in when you're available, and it will not disrupt the call. We also have the chat box available. If you have questions, you can type them there. Uh, I'll be monitoring that, and we'll relay them to our presenter at an opportune moment. And as I said, we're leaving the phone lines open, so questions can be asked that way as well. With that, I will hand the controls over to Mark Priven. Mark? Okay, thank you, Emily. Uh, can you hear me okay? Sounds clear here. Okay, good. So, um, so I've been asked to speak a little bit about um, actuarial studies. How do you read an actuarial study? And um, so I've subtitled this uh, Ask Geeky. And the reason is I was thinking about, I'm going to show my age here, but I was thinking about um, sort of technology and, uh, and, and how it's changed over the years. And I remember um, walking down the street, um, probably a couple of decades ago now, walking down the street and um, noticing that a lot of people seem to be talking to themselves. And uh, it was a little bit alarming to me because, you know, I was used to when people talk to themselves, you know, maybe there's a diagnosis or there's something going on. But it seemed to be happening more and more. Uh, but then when I looked a little bit closer, um, you know, I noticed that usually they had a little phone pressed to their ear. And uh, so what I wasn't used to is that now there were cell phones and people were just randomly walking around the street um, you know, talking on the phone, and it was something that really took a little bit of getting used to. Um, and then the second stage was, you know, people walking down the street, and they're talking to themselves, and now they got their hands in their pockets. They don't, and so you look a little closer, and, you know, there's, 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 no, there's no phone that you can see pressed to their ear or anything, and, of course, you know, that was, that was Bluetooth. Um, and now what I see is people walking along, talking to their phones, um, and they're actually not talking to anybody. They're actually just talking to their phones uh, because now we have Siri and other, you know, other uh, um, technology Q&A type things where people just actually just walking down the street talking to their phones. So I thought, okay, well, um, that's a little bit like what's happen what happens with actuarial. I mean, people uh, you know, ask Siri questions. And, uh, and I think a lot of people might think an actuary is more like Siri than like themselves. So what I thought I would do in this presentation is um, frame it as, let's ask Geeky. And we'll co compare and contrast some things that you might ask Siri and some questions that she, she or he may give versus uh, questions that you might ask Geeky and, uh, and my answers. So uh, I, I lined up a few questions here for uh, what you might ask Geeky uh, about what's uh, in an actuarial study. Uh, what is that illustrious IBNR? Uh, what are confidence levels? What's discounting? What's exposure? And I think most importantly, the last couple of things, how do my results compare to those of others? Um, and are my results improving over time? And feel free to, uh, to, to uh, you know, ask questions or, or um, type questions on the chat line uh, as we go through. So, First, I thought we'd start with some Siri questions. People ask Siri really strange things. Um, so one thing, and these are, these are true, by the way. If you have a, an iPhone, you can actually ask Siri these questions. And she has uh, multiple responses. But uh, one is, um, you say, Siri, I love you. Do you love me? And one response that Siri gives is, you are the wind beneath my wings, which I love. Um, not happy with that. If you, if you persist and say, Siri, I, I love you, Siri says, impossible. No, I really love you, Siri. I bet you say that to all your Apple products. So whoever programmed Siri actually anticipated, <laughs> amazingly, in my mind, 
um, some of the types of questions that might come to Siri. Here's another one that I like. Um, asking Siri, are you human? Does it matter? Yes. I thought so. Okay, well, are you human? Close enough, I'd say. Now, people don't actually ask me that often if I'm human, but sometimes I see it a little bit in the light of their eyes when I get up to do an actuarial study. It's like, okay, is this, kind of guy, is this guy going to be more Vulcan or more human? So um, I, I relate a little bit to this, uh, to this series of questions regarding Siri. Um, going to Geeky here, here's the today's environment. Once a year, we do actuarial studies based on June 30 data. And um, we do an auto liability, an auto study, which has both liability and physical damage, which is 155 pages long. We do a GL study for the campuses, which is 88 pages long. We do a GL study, general liability study for, um, for the medical centers, which is another 88 pages long. We, similarly, we do two studies for employment practices liability, which are each 82 pages long, property, med mal, workers comp, so all told, the current environment is Geeky generates about 1,000 pages a year just on June 30 data. Uh, to put that in perspective, that is about almost three quarters of War and Peace. Okay. <laughs> so I can certainly understand why you would like a webinar that sort of breaks down a little bit and says, okay, how do we find the highlights of War and Peace? We're really not interested in reading three quarters of War and Peace every year. Um, just give us, you know, what, tell us what we can get out of this actuarial study or these actuarial studies that's important to us. So the first thing is I've highlighted um, an actual page from, an act, from one of the actuarial studies. This is an employment practices liability um, study. And it shows <clears throat> by location as of June 30, 2011, because the 2012 reports are not finalized yet. Um, it shows by location, case reserves, what we call IBNR, total liabilities, and then discounted and 65% confidence liabilities. I'm going to sort of break it down and explain what's IBNR, what's discounted, what's 65% confidence level. And the short answer for what IBNR is is it's what the university owes that's not case reserves. And case reserves are the reserves set on individual claims that, um, that an adjuster looks at and says, okay, I think this claim is going to cost this much money. We need to set aside this much money for that individual claim. And then the actuaries come in and say, yeah, but you need an extra, in this case, $28.7 million in total um, for other stuff. So the question is, what is that other stuff and how do you really go about, how do we really go about calculating it, figuring it out? Uh, just to be formal about it, IBNR stands for incurred but not reported. So in other words, the incident which arises, to, which gives rise to the claim has already occurred and so therefore the university needs to set aside money for that uh, on an accounting basis. Um, but um, either the claim has not been reported yet, or if it has been reported, um, the case reserves that have been established for it we think are not enough. And so there needs to be an additional amount of money set aside um, in addition to the case reserves. So that's what IBNR is. And talk a little bit about how we calculate it. So this blue line here is a payment pattern. And it's for an individual year. So here, this is one year after an incident. And notice that almost nothing, this is again for employment practices liability, that almost nothing on average is paid within the first year after an incident. So we get this question all the time. Um, my gosh, the 2011-2012 year is looking great. We've had almost no payments on 2011-2012, you know, um, incidents for employment practices liability. And we say, well, that's really nice, but our expectation is that maybe 1% or less of the total ultimate cost of those claims would have been paid by now. 
And what, the way we get this is that we look at older years that are now fully mature, and we look at how the payment pattern has come out for those years. So we may take the 2006 year and say, okay, how much was paid in the first year on those incidents that occurred in 2006? Uh, how much was paid in the second year? How much was paid in the third year? And so on. And based on that, we come up with this blue line. Um, so you can see here that employment practice liability is a pretty stretched out payment pattern. Even two years after an incident, we would only expect about 5% of the, of the total losses, the total ultimate cost of those claims to be paid out. And you can see these black arrows here. Thank you. Please stand by. Disconnected. Are we back? Hello, everybody. Apologies for the, in for the inconvenience. Uh, we oh, lost good. The call, but we are back <laughs> up now. Wonderful. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's sort of interest, don't you think? <laughs> so, uh, I Hello. We're actively dialing back in right now. Two thirds of the folks have been reconnected. Let's give it just a moment. This is Louise, and at least I'm in. I'll shut up now. <laughs> no, no, it's good to know the folks are back. No, it's a fascinating conference because I always enjoy hearing about actuaries because I never really understand it, but I keep hoping that I will. And the IBNR, that's so exciting. I had it almost, I, I thought it was recorded, and it's really reported. <laughs> Come back up, so I think we can get restarted again. Apologies for the inconvenience, everybody. And uh, Mark, if you could maybe rewind us about 30 seconds in your talk. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure what's. Well, I, actually, I first before I. Be you had just talked about how uh, we, we don't see anything in the first year after the incident, and. Okay. Uh, yeah, lost okay. lost development factors payout pattern EPL. Okay, and let me just, uh, I see, I'm reading the, uh, the, the chat line here, and I see that um, somebody asked for an example of an employment practices liability claim. <laughs> so employment, employment practices liability is um, generally uh, uh, where an employee sues the employer for um, something re related to their employment itself. So it could be discrimination based on age, gender, um, race, anything like that. It could the discrimination could be about termination. It could be about not being promoted. Um, those are the. I'm sorry. Uh, sure. Uh oh, he stopped again. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So those are those are sort of examples of employment practices liability claims. <laughs> um, so now here's the payout pattern. So um, I mentioned that we expect very little of um, li of these types of claims to be paid out within the first year after an incident occurs. Um, and part of it is that there's a statute of limitations. You may not even know about the claim or about the incident for a while after it occurs. So um, as these black lines indicate, um, it's not until four years after an incident occurs that we would, on average, expect half of the payments to be made. Okay, so there's a very long payout pattern here, and you can see that um, th that would mean that there would mean there would need to be a lot of liabilities set aside to pay for these claims. So another way to think about this blue line here is everything below the blue line is already paid. So, for example, at year four, 50% of the, of the ultimate losses, of the ultimate cost of those claims are paid, but another 50% are unpaid. So another 50% are liabilities. And so um, you can just look at sort of the, the area above this blue line and see that is the total liabilities, that's the total unpaid. Uh, it's a pretty big portion of the total graph. And so there tends to be a lot of liabilities, a lot of reserves needed associated with employment practices liability. So again, thinking about four years after uh, uh, an incident occurs, we expect about half, on average, half of the losses to be paid and half to be unpaid. So another way to look at that is if we have a year that's four years old, and let's say the total payments to date are $4 million, then we might say, okay, 
we expect total payments to be double that because we expect half to be paid and half to be unpaid. So we're going to say the ultimate loss is $8 million, $4 million paid, $4 million unpaid or, or liability. So I hope that makes sense. So that's how we would use a loss development factor. That's how we, that's how we use this one way that we use these, um, these payment patterns. So I'm going to add another twist to it now and show not only a payment pattern, but a loss incurred pattern. And by incurred loss, what I mean is payments and case reserves together. So here, um, in year one, we expect maybe 1% of the losses to be paid, but because those few claims that have been reported have case reserves on them, it's more like 5% of the losses have been incurred, meaning if you added up their payments and their case reserves in total, it would be 5% of the ultimate loss. And here at year four, where 50% was paid, um, close to 80% is incurred. Okay? Another way to think about this, again, is the area below the blue line is everything that's already paid, the area between the red and the blue line is case reserves because the only difference between the paid and the blue line and the incurred and the red line is that you're adding in case reserves. So this area here, between the area between the blue and the red is the case reserves, and then the area above the red is a liability, but it's not case reserves, and so it's IBNR. Okay? So let's go to the next, and you can see exactly what I mean here. So the blue is the paid to date, so that reddish color um, is the case reserves, and the green is the IVNR. And so I hope this gives you kind of a visual understanding of why in employment practices liability the IVNR is so much higher than the case reserves. In this case, it's um, almost triple the case reserves, and it's because in those early years, years one, two, and three, the IVNR, the green portion, is so high um, that you know, that not only have losses not been paid, but there aren't even enough case reserves on those claims. Um, again, sometimes because those claims have not even been reported yet, there's a statute of limitations and so on. And so in order to make sure that there's enough money set aside for them, uh, we put that in IVNR. So that's employment yeah, practices like... We have oh, a question go ahead. in the chat box about uh, oh. Kiki's opinion about reserving practices. Uh, question yes. Is, uh, yeah. So the question from the chat box is, does Geeky have an opinion about whether reserving practices are conservative or liberal? Um, no, I do not have an opinion on that. I mean, I think, I think that, you know, UC's um, goal in general is to make the case reserves accurate and to, um, to make sure that enough money is set aside on those individual claims that they know about to, um, to, to pay for those individual claims, um, I don't think that um, there's a that there's a that there's a real a bias there. Um, and if there were, we would catch that um, in our loss development factors, and we would adjust our IBNR up or down based on whether we thought the case reserves were were um, conservative or aggressive. Uh, there's another question here about workers' comp, and I'm going to talk about workers' comp in a second, so I'm going to put that on hold for now. And, uh, and we'll get to it in a, in a couple of slides. Um, so this is employment practices liability. So I wanted to show what some other, what some other coverages look like. Um, and um, I just put, gave these because they're pretty extreme examples. The green line here is property. And property, unlike liability or workers' comp really, um, the losses develop extremely quickly, which means that the payments and the case reserves come in very quickly um, because you don't have litigation. There isn't a lot of dispute um, in you know, compared to um, liability and workers' comp. And so you can see that by year three, on this green line, by year three, um, about 95% of the costs have already been paid out. So it's a much more straightforward uh, coverage to deal with in terms of figuring out liabilities because the payout pattern is so much faster. On the other hand, EPL and GL, general liability, have kind of an interesting relationship. Um, initially, general liability claims tend to be paid a little bit quicker than employment practices liability, and that's why the red line is higher than the blue line for the first couple years. But then as we get out into the tail, 
the employment practices liability claims tend to um, resolve a little more quickly than the um, than the general liability claim. So, um, so there's kind of a, a a discrepancy. You know, you can't say one pays out faster than the other. Um, it depends on whether you're talking about the early years versus the later years. GL is faster um, initially, but then um, but then slower later on. Um, okay, so as an example here for property, um, remember on employment practices liability, this green area was huge compared to the red area. On property, there's very little IVNR and very little case reserves compared to the paid. And um, the case reserves, and, and not only that, but the ratio of IVNR to case reserves is quite low. So here we have $3 million in IVNR, $15 million in case reserves. So we have much lower IVNR than there are case reserves, um, unlike employment practice liability, where I think we had the IVNR, um, you know, double or more of the um, of the case reserves. So these the concept of IVNR and how we calculate the liabilities or or what the liabilities look like depend very substantially on the coverage. And now I'm going to get to the workers' comp question. Um, this graph shows. Um, the case reserves and the IVNR um, for each coverage for UC as of June 30, 2011. And the reason I show this is to see is to show you exactly what this question was asking is um, the relationship between the IVNR and the case reserves. So you can see here, to me, a little bit surprisingly, workers' comp requires more IVNR in relation to the case reserves than a bunch, then liability, even med mal liability. This is a professional liability, professional liability medical malpractice. Um, um, tends to have very strong case reserves and doesn't need IVNR, needs less IVNR than there is case reserves. Um, auto liability, just a little bit more IVNR than case reserves. General liability, lower oh, IVNR. Uh, and it's really employment practices liability and comp that. Um, that have a lot of IBNR in relation to the case reserves. And in workers' comp, a lot of it is medical. It's so unpredictable um, that, you know, which claims will, um, quote, blow up and become, you know, go from, you know, a small, relatively small, benign-looking injury into something that's going to wind up costing a lot of money. It's very hard for a claims adjuster to set aside case reserves for that because initially it may look like a small injury, and so in order to make sure, again, that UC has the money set aside for that type of event, um, it has to go into IBNR. So I hope that addressed the question of IBNR for workers' comp. Um, going back to Siri, um, people ask all kinds of questions of Siri. So here's one. Can you talk dirty to me, Siri? Oh, this is a cute response. Compost silt mud. Um, Another question for Siri, who's on first? Kind of a trick question here, you know, Abbott and Costello, uh, who's on first, what's on second? So Siri won't buy it. She says, correct. <laughs> Who is on first? <laughs> okay. So we've covered IBNR, and now we're going to go to the second uh, concept here, which is discounted. So what does it mean when we say that the liabilities are discounted? And in order to answer that question, we're going to go back to the payment pattern. So this is the cumulative, what we call a cumulative payment pattern. So it means it, sh it, it shows um, what the total percent of losses will be paid as of a certain number of years of the incident. So for example, by year six, maybe 85% of losses will be paid. Or by year four, 50% of losses will be paid. But the question is, how much is paid in year four, or how much is paid in year six, not, cumul not cumulatively up to year four or six. And that's what's in this graph. So this graph shows by year what percent of ultimate losses are paid. Uh, this is, and again, this is just an on average kind of number. Um, so you can see here that very little is paid in the beginning, the first couple years. Very little is paid, thankfully, at the end in years, you know, eight, nine, ten. And the bulk of it kind of looks a little bit like a bell curve is paid in years, you know, three, four, five, and a fair amount in year six as well. So the question is, how are we going to use this to 
tech cited discount factor. And for employment practice liability, we assume a 2% discount rate. And what that means is that we're assuming that if you put money aside now, it would earn interest at 2% and it would then be available to pay off uh, an employment practices liability case. So for example, um, if the payment was made in year four, in other words, four years after the incident, if you put aside a certain amount of money now, how much would you have to put aside now in order to have a dollar in year four to pay for that payment um, on that incident? And the answer is, according to these black lines here, about 93 cents. So if you took 93 cents now and when the incident occurred and you just put it aside and it had it earned 2%, then you would have a dollar available to pay off um, that payment that's made in year four. Okay? And what we need to do then is combine these two concepts. So at the bottom here is what we already saw, the percent of payments by year. And this red line here is how much money you would need to set aside for, um, in order to have a dollar available to pay, for, um, to pay for that claim. So for example, out here in year nine, 2% of your payments are gonna occur, but you would only need to set aside 84 cents on the dollar for those 2% in order to make sure that you had a dollar available to pay that 2%. Um, and so what we do is we simply take a weighted average. We take this, for example, 99% and multiply it by 1% for year one. And then for year two, we would take the 5% and multiply it by um, this number here, which is um, about 97%, and so on. We would multiply all those together, and then we would get this dotted line here, which is the weighted average. What that weighted average means is on average, if you took aside, if, if, if your liabilities were a dollar, you'd only have to set aside 94.8 cents. And on average, you would have enough money, because you're earning 2% a year, you'd have enough money to pay that dollar when you, when you actually have to pay it out. So that's the weighted average discount factor. And if we actually go to an exhibit in the actuarial study, again, this is from the EPL study, and you can see here the total liability is 38,554. And if we multiply it by that 9.948, we get the discounted liability or net present value liability of 36,532. So that's the net present value liability at expected. And again, just to show how different coverages work. Um, the liability, uh, the liability coverages all have discounts, you know, between 93 cents and 95 cents or so. Employment practice liability, general liability, and auto. Um, so they're all sort of in the same range. On the other hand, medical malpractice has a longer payout pattern, and so you need less. Um, you get a lower discount factor, so you only need to set aside 80 cent, 88 cents on the dollar for med mal. And workers comp even longer, only have to set aside 81 cents on the dollar. So I hope that makes sense. Let's see here. Oh, another question for Siri. What do you look like? Apparently she gets this one a lot. This is one of the more popular ones. In the cloud, no one cares what you look like. Another question, can you tell me a joke? Um, people ask, uh, this, this is a question that gets to geeky all the time. Tell me an actuarial joke. Um, and I usually flop just like Siri. Two iPhones walk into a bar. I forget the rest. Okay. Going back to our initial exhibit here, where we show case reserves, IVNR, we covered that, we covered discounted, and now 65% confidence level. So what's, what in the world is the confidence level? What's all that about? So let me explain a little bit. So our numbers are projections. We don't know for, we don't know for certain what's going to happen, and we don't pretend to know for certain what's going to happen. So one thing that we'll do is we'll simulate what we, what we expect to happen and look at the variability with the potential things that might happen 
look like. So for example, let's say we're looking at the future and we do 10 simulations. Each one of these dots is essentially a potential future, something that could happen. And in one simulation we have um, about 65 claims and the total cost is $17 million. In another simulation we may have 75 claims and the total cost is $13 million and so on. And so we've simulated 10 different potential uh, ways that the future may unfold. So one thing that we do is we sort this in order. So these are the same 10 dots, but now they're in order and um, from lowest to highest. And what that allows us to do is establish what we call confidence levels. So we know if, there, if the 10 simulations rep represent all the possible things that could possibly happen, um, then we just have to look at the fifth one and we know that 50% of the time losses will be lower than that, so lower than about $16.5 million. Or if we wanted to look at a 70% confidence level, then we would look at here, it's about a little over $18 million, and we would say, okay, um, there's a 70% chance that losses will unfold to be less than $18 million, and a 30% chance that losses will unfold to be higher than a little over $18 million. And so um, this is basically how we look at confidence levels. In, in, in our parlance, we would say 70% chance that losses will be less than 18 million or so, that's a 70% confidence level because you're 70% confident that losses will be, be below that layer. So uh, when we actually do this, we don't just do 10 simulations, we'll do 1,000 or maybe 10,000 or so. And, uh, but we'll you know, do this exactly as I described before. We'll just look at what's at 50%, we'll look at what's at 75% if we're looking at a 75% confidence level, and we'll just look at what the actual losses are. Now, there's one thing um, that I want to show which is expected. So if you took all these blue dots and you averaged them out, um, you, would get this, you would get the solid blue line. Okay? And one thing that I want to show you is that the solid blue line, uh, where it matches the, the dots, is actually a little bit above 50% confidence level. So, um, this is a common question for Geeky. And the, 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 the reason for that is that the blue line, the solid blue line, is what we call the average or the mean. So it's the, ex or sometimes we call it expected. It's the average of all the outcomes. It's the mean. The 50% the, the confidence is what's called the median. It just means that 50% of the outcomes are below that number and 50% of the outcomes are above that number. But if you look at the actual outcomes, they are what we call skewed. And I'm going to go back a slide and show you what I mean. So if you look at the 50% confidence level, you'll see that the, one, the dots that are below it are somewhat below it. But the ones that are above it, especially the ones above 90%, are way, way, way above it. And what that means is that when you take an average, those numbers that are way high are going to drive up the average. They don't affect the median so much. It's just each one of those dots is just one dot above or a one dot below. It doesn't matter how much above or how much below. But because the ones that are above at 90% and 90 to 100% are so much higher, they will drive up the average. And so that's why this blue line um, is actually above 50% confidence level. And that's very, very common. Almost every coverage that we work with, um, the, the expected losses are higher than the 50% confidence level. And in this example now, let's say we want to look at losses at 75% confidence level. We, what we would do here is we would look at the roughly about $20 million is what corresponds to 75%. We would look, compare that to the blue line, the solid blue line, and take a ratio of 1.164. And now, in the actuarial study, the expected number is 36,532. We would multiply that by 1.164, which gets you to 75% confidence level, and then you end up with 42,523. So that's how we calculate the confidence level, and that's what it means. Uh, oh, I got a question here on what do you base your simulations? 
Um, so typically, um, we look at we, we simulate number of claims, and then for each claim, we simulate a claim size. So, for example, let's say we're dealing with workers' comp, and there's you know um, 500 claims a year. Um, then. Was that a question? No. Okay. Let's say there's about 500 claims a year, but some claim, some years there's 450, some claims, some years there's 480, some years there's 520, and so we will um, we'll do a mathematical distribution that that um, that projects not only that they're going to be on average 500 claims, but it takes into account that you know sometimes there'll be more, sometimes there'll be less. And then we also do a distribution for each one of those claims. So for each one of those 500 claims, or if we simulate 470 claims for each one of those 470 claims, we'll look at how big is that claim. Is it a $5 claim? Is it a $10,000 claim? And so on. And that's also based on UC's own history. And so we'll do a simulation for every year, how many claims do we expect, and, and what, do we what do we expect the cost of each one of those claims to be. And then that's how we arrive at the total ultimate cost. So I hope that addresses the question of what we base the simulations on. Um, okay. Now we're getting into more more difficult questions for Siri. What is the meaning of life? Think about questions like this. I can't answer this now, but give me some time to write a very long play in which nothing happens. Um, for those of you like me with a strong liberal arts education, you'll appreciate this, um, having sat through many of these plays and tried to analyze them. Um, I think it, it rings true. I don't know, but I think there's an app for that. And I think the, the most lucid answer, all evidence today suggests that it's chocolate. Another. Uh, Another question for Siri. Oh, no, question for Geeky. Okay, what is exposure? Um, so we talk a lot about, um, we talk about loss rates for workers' comp or, or any of the coverages. Um, what that is is losses in relation to exposure. So for a, and according to AM Best, it's the vulnerability to a loss usually expressed in dollars or units. So for example, workers' compensation, the exposure base is payroll. Uh, because workers' compensation claims come from employees, and, um, and the workers' compensation benefits, at least their temporary disability benefits and permanent disability benefits, do vary based on the payroll, or based on the wages that the, that the injured worker has. Um, so we use payroll as an exposure base. For um, employment practices liability and general liability, um, we use FTE for auto. Obviously, an auto claim is going to come from a vehicle, so we use vehicles. Uh, so what that means is, um, you know, if we had a location with 10 vehicles, we would expect a certain amount of loss. Um, that uh, if a, we had a vehicle, if we had a location that had 20 vehicles um, that had the same sort of propensity of loss, we would expect. Twice the twice the amount of losses. So it's, it's what we use, that's what we call an exposure base. Property, obviously, insured value, and MedMal is quite complicated. Um, just a small printout of what we use for MedMal. Um, we look at the different physician specialties, and the reason is that the different things that physicians do have uh, very different likelihoods to um, give rise to medical malpractice claims. And so um, we feel it's important to look at um, not just you know how many docs do you have, but what are they actually doing? What, what are their specialties? So here's the partial list. Here's more of the list. And not only that, but we also look at other exposures, such as number of visits, um, number of surgeries, number of nurses, deliveries, and so on. So the, the MedMal is by far the most complicated uh, in terms of analyzing the exposure to loss. Okay. Siri, where can I buy drugs? Um, I like this one. What kind of place are you looking for? Pharmacies or an addiction treatment center? Um, the blue pill or the red one? 
For those of you that are Inception fans, um, Siri was ready with an answer. Either way, I'll still be here when you wake up. Okay. Um, now let's get to the meat of it. How do, I, how do my results compare with those of other locations? I'm going to go a little quickly on this because I see that it's already 1043, um, and I want to get to the last two things, um, these last two things. So the, the, the short thing is, first of all, we, um, we do what's called experience modification. And that, and that means that we look at how you compare, how one location compares with the average of all the locations. And in order to do that, we take a three-year average. So let's say we were doing this year's experience modification factor. We would look at the three years, 2008, 9, and 10. We skip the most recent year because um, it's so immature. Um, and we also lop out the excess losses because those can really throw things off when we're really most interested in, um, in the primary layer. So um, it, that might be losses limited to $100,000 or $150,000 depending on the coverage. But we really want to look at, uh, we, don't, we don't want to be thrown off by individual huge claims. So we look at a three-year average. So in this case, the three-year average is 14.79. And then we compare that to the average of all the locations of 24.92. And based on that, we calculate what's called a relativity. And all that means is how is this one location relative to all the locations in total? So in this case, 14.79 is the individual location. Divide that by the total of 24.92, and you get a relativity of 0.59. So the rule of thumb is a relativity less than one is good because it means that your average is better than the average for all locations. Um, and a relativity greater than one means that your experience is higher than average. So all these numbers are actually right here in an actuarial study. This is an actual page right out of the actuarial report. And it shows for, in this case, UC Davis, for this individual coverage had a loss rate of 14.79. The average for everybody was 24.92. And so the relativity is 0.59. So that's the way you hone in on this exhibit and you can see how you compare to other locations. Uh, uh, another quick one for Siri. Can you call me an ambulance? Okay, Mark, from now on I will call you an ambulance. Um, Mark, quick question in the chat box. Uh, some oh. actuaries seem to be much more conservative than others. Why is that? Does a client's preferred outcome impact the actuary's findings? Some actuaries are more conservative than others. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll say that a lot of a lot of actuarial work is judgment. Um, you know, you what happens is you, you you know you line up all the statistics, you look at how things have been in the past, but at the end of the day, you have to project the future. And the question is, how much is the past indicative of the future? If you see changes, you know, if you see trends, uh, how quickly do you respond to those? Uh, or, or maybe you say those aren't really trends, that's just kind of a random thing happening, and so uh, I'm just going I'm, I'm, I'm not going to assume that that's going to continue into the future. And so there really is a lot of judgment, and it's also, um, it's important to know the program well. So if you see, like, for example, things improving and you know that UC made a big investment in Be Smart About Safety, then you might feel, um, you know, better about assuming that that good experience is going to continue into the future than if, you know, sometimes things look like they're getting better and you ask the client, you know, well, why is this? What, what's going on here? And they go, I don't know. I guess it's just luck. And then you go, okay, well, I guess it's luck, and I'm not going to assume that that's going to continue into the future. So um, there's no getting away from that. There's a lot of judgment involved. And so I think it's just, you know, whenever you have judgment, um, you're going to have some people who are more conservative, some people who are more aggressive, and, 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 and so forth. So, you know, our philosophy is always to is just try to be as accurate as we can. We don't try to we don't try to slight the numbers up or down. We just try to be accurate, and we know that in the long term that's the best thing for UC. Um, does a client's preferred outcome impact an actuary's findings? Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes clients do try to pressure the actuary for a particular finding. UC is very good about that. They don't, they don't, you know, call me up and say, Mark, can you make this any lower? 
uh, or higher or anything like that. So um, that's not a, um, an issue really with UC. But, um, but there are clients who try to pressure actuaries, and, uh, and you know, it can get difficult. Um, you know, again, my perspective is that I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be as accurate as possible. In the long run, that's the best thing for the client. Um, the one time, and so I, you know, I, I, I try not to take into account, um, you know, the pressure that's, that, that a client may bear on you. Um, the one thing that where there is, um, where there is room, I'll say, um, um, for, for being more conservative or less conservative based on what the client prefers is the discount rate. Um, you know, I, we use discount rates, I've used discount rates as low as 1%, assuming that, you know, investment income will be as low as 1%. I've used discount rates even currently as high as, you know, maybe 3% or 3.5% um, based on, you know, a, a client wanting to be more aggressive with their, with their assumption regarding investment earnings. I'm not a specialist in investment earnings. I'm not, um, that's not, you know, I'm more projecting claims cost. And so um, I will defer to the client as long as it's within a reasonable range. If they told me to use 10% a year, I wouldn't use it. But as long as it's within a reasonable range, um, I, will, um, I will go along with what the client wants. And so that is an example where, um, you know, a client's, quote, preferred outcome as to what their discount rate is will affect my findings. Um, but Again, it has to be within a, a reasonable range, and they have to be able to say why you know why they think it's reasonable. But um, that's the only example I can really think of. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. So uh, if you want to look at how your results are changing over time, one way is to look at how your X mod changes over time, or or how your relativity changes over time. So in this example, Davis's X mod was 0.59. The year before it was 0.89, and so that's clear improvement. Um, another, but, but this is really just comparing two three-year averages. I don't think it's a particularly good way to do it. Here's a better way. Uh, once a year, we provide all the locations with, with what's called a location report, and in that report, we will show for each coverage. Um, and I, again, I'm just using EPL as an example, but we have the same thing for GL and auto and comp and so on. Um, exactly how your location compares to the UC program in total. And so you can see in general, for example, if I was Davis, are the blue lines generally higher than the, I'm not even going to try to pick a color for the UC program, sort of brownish orange. Uh, are they generally higher? Are they trending differently? Um, what's going on here. And so, you know, if I was Davis, I would say, okay, well, it looks like, you know, in the years 2000 through 2002, maybe there was a bit of a problem. There were, you know, in general, the losses were quite, quite higher than the UC program. But since then, uh, the blue bars are generally lower. The exception of a couple of years are generally lower than those of the UC program. So it seems like uh, whatever the issue was back then has been addressed. And uh, with a couple of, probably I'm guessing there's some large claims in 07 and 09 um, that Davis has pretty consistently outperformed um, the UC program. So this, I would suggest using the location report as a way to see how your losses are changing over time and how they compare to um, those of the UC program. So. Looks like we have a couple of questions in the chat box. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, so one question. Uh, do you take recent trends into account? Um, we do take recent years into account. Uh, it's difficult. So, for, you know, again, it depends on the coverage. So, for example, we talked about property where the losses emerge very quickly. And so a recent trend is actually something you can make sense of because you actually know what's happened in the last couple of years. On, on the other hand, employment practices liability or workers' comp or some of the other coverages, they're so slow to emerge. The costs and the claims are so slow to emerge that it's very difficult to, you know, look at just the most recent year or two and put too much credibility on it because, um, 
because there's so much still unknown about those years. And so the answer is yes, we do respond to recent trends, but we will temper that depending on what coverage we're looking at. Um, and also we'll temper that based on what we know is going on in the program. So if we know that Workers' Comp has just implemented a big WorkStrong program and that they're you know, addressing um, issues related to people doing multiple claims, um, and then we see a, a decrease in frequency related to that, well then we'll, we'll, um, we'll give that some credibility because we know that there's been a program that's addressed it and that, that it makes sense that those claims are decreasing. So it's also we respond in the context of what we know what's going on with UC. Okay, if you have time, can you talk about adverse development? Um, is it comparing IBNR year to year? So adverse development is um, based on our development patterns, we set an expectation of what's going to happen next year. So for example, if um, the, we have a year that's three years old, say that you know the 2009 year, and it's three years old, and um, we can make an expectation of what we think will happen in the next 12 months on injuries which occurred in 2009. We think that they're going to cost X amount, and we think that the case reserves are going to go up or down or, and, or whatever. And we can do that for every single year, for, for incidents for every year. We can say this is what we think is going to happen between 7-1-2012 and 6-30-2013 on all those open claims and all those things, incidents which have already occurred. And then the question is when we go back and we look at the actual experience which occurred in 2012-2013, the question is did that meet our expectation or did it not? If the claims activity was higher than what we thought it would be, we typically call that adverse development, meaning um, that the payments were higher than we thought they were going to be, maybe the reported claim counts were higher than we thought they would be, maybe we were expecting case reserves to go down as claims close over time, but in fact as um, there were some adverse developments on individual claims which caused people to reevaluate those case reserves and increase them instead, so that's what we call adverse development. Um, if you have time, can you comment? Okay, uh, the role of a loss development triangle. So the yes, yeah, so the loss development triangle is how we set the expectation of the payment patterns and the incurred development patterns over time. And I wish I had a I wish I had a visual of it because it's not it's 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 easy to see visually, but it's hard to describe. But basically what the triangle represents is, um, let's take an individual year, like for workers' compensation, take the 2005-2006 year, all the injuries which occur in that year. What a triangle will show you is what are the costs of those claims at different valuation points? What is the cost on those same claims, all occurring in 05-06? What is their cost as of the end of 06? What is their cost as of the end of 07? What is their cost as of the end of 08? And so on. And so what that allows you to do is see is is develop um, your payment patterns and your incurred loss patterns over time. And so a triangle will just show you multiple years in terms of injuries occurring in in you know 05, 06, 07, 08, 09, and so on. It'll show you each of those years, and it'll show for each of those years, it'll show you different valuation dates. So I'm sorry that's a hard thing to describe, but um, Maybe another time I'll do it. I'll do a presentation on, on triangles because that's a, that's a hard one. Okay, another question. Do actuaries measure the accuracy of their estimates over time? Are there performance standards for the actuaries? Uh, the answer is yes. We, we, we measure the accuracy of our estimates over time. We all, in all our reports, well, not every single one, but in our major reports, um, we compare our new estimates to our old ones and we will give an explanation as to why the estimates have changed between the old one and the new one. Um, and so, and we're, we're very interested in when the last one, if the prior one was inaccurate, why was it inaccurate? Um, we have very, you know, we have several different ways of analyzing the, um, the losses, and, and so we want to know which ways that we're analyzing are most accurate in have been most accurate in the last year and which ones have not been the most accurate. And that way we can give more credence to the ones that have been more accurate and less credence to those that have not been accurate. So we definitely measure um, um, our performance over time. Are there performance standards for actuaries? Um, not that I'm aware of. 
uh, <laughs> uh, there is no um, there is no metric out there that says um, you know from one study to to the next the 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 you know the projection should be off by this much or or accurate by so much. Um, the probably the closest that you'll get to that is um, surplus standards for insurance companies. So, for example, um, an insurance company's surplus is largely there in order to um, make sure that there's enough money to pay off all the commitments that that insurance company has made. And um, things that can throw off an insurance company's ability to pay include, you know, are they earning enough investment income or was their actuary correct in how they projected their, their total liabilities? Because if you know, the actuary says the liabilities are $100 million, they actually wind up being $200 million, well then that insurance company better have a lot of surplus to cover that missed estimate. And so there are standards um, in, the, in the industry for how much surplus an insurance company needs to have, and that's probably the closest that you can get, I think, for, um, for, perform for performance standards for actuaries. And I'll say that those vary by coverage quite a bit. So, you know, if you're dealing just with property, you have a different amount of surplus required than if you are a workers' comp carrier versus if you are a, you know, mortgage guarantee company or whatever. So, it'll vary quite a bit. Okay. Um, okay, a couple more quick questions for Siri. What's your favorite? These are, these are softball for Siri. What's your favorite computer? Clearly the Apple Mac. What's your favorite tablet? Clearly the iPad. What's your favorite phone? What? There are other phones? And uh, another one for Siri. When will pigs fly? When they grow wings. I'm just amazed that somebody sat down and actually anticipated that people would ask Siri these questions and then programmed in these answers. Uh, when they figure out how to buy airline tickets, and when inserted to a circus cannon, who's uses lip. Okay, so if there are any more questions, you guys have been great about asking questions through chat and so forth. If you have any more questions, feel free. But I will tell you all that you are the wind beneath my wings. Any questions? We're at 11 o'clock on the dot. All right. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Apologies for the minor technical difficulties in the middle. And we hope you will join us again in future months.